I'm writing this ahead of time for once, right after episode 7 is released. The episodes should not really affect each other. And for this first one, I have a lot to say, but at the same time, a lot I don't want to say. Because first, I don't want to hint to future events. And second, I get a bit bored writing about stuff I've already talked about. And I have made a very in-depth video about the second chapter adapted here. By the way, chapter 66 and 67. Do not watch the video if you're an anime only, it at least alludes to spoilers. And yeah, this is maybe my favorite chapter in the series, the trial happening here. And right off the bat, it's not as easy to see why in this episode, it lost some of its luster in the adaptation. Visually, most characters look really good for the most part, minimal animation, but I think the direction wasn't strong enough. And this is not unusual for me to feel for the Vinland adaptation, to be honest. But here I've studied this chapter a lot, and I feel like I know why. There's just so much energy in this chapter, flipping from character to character, constant shifts in tone, and the paneling and expressions of the manga carry. And there's also just more of that in the manga. We're always switching to see how the characters, how Arnheide and Dolmar react. Watching the anime was like, will they give me this snake expression? Yes! The Arnheide framing here? No. Thorgil and Kettle here? Yes. The rapid Arnheide's two reactions here? No. Or this Olmar one? No. It almost feels like Olmar and Arnheide don't exist in the scene anymore after the trial starts. And especially Arnheide, there is meaning keeping her present here. I feel like the switching from character to character in the manga did add a lot to the pacing and emotion and even as further repeated characterization for them. You could afford to add some more intensity here in the episode also. At points they tried, but I definitely wanted more. I feel like I can look to the manga and imagine an episode that's way better and uses all the intentionality of the panels in this chapter. Also, like the previous chapter, don't cut out the fun dialogue, like, all thanks to your lesson, Snake, or like, thanks to the miserable English, right? You need to stretch anyway, <laughs> why the decision to cut it? It's not, it's not important at all, but just, why? So this episode starts with Snake and the guests tracking some thieves. We were talking about thieves last episode. And I just barely didn't mention this in episode 6, but the anime really brightens up visually dark scenes. Like in the manga it makes sense they have torches, it's pitch black. In the anime it's like bright outside, I don't know why there's this much light. What's even the point in stealing at night if it makes zero difference on visibility anyways? I'd rather see darker nights for the atmosphere, but it's nothing really important. I also want to compliment the music here. I enjoy the new chill music a lot, like the flute and the Skyrim OST. Good stuff. They're not afraid of the lighter tone. Gives me a break from the sad piano. This scene with Arnheide and Einar here is a cool setup. Arnheide is nice to him, it makes his day, he's super happy, and it hard cuts to the slab. They got that right in the anime. There is a very clear difference between Thorfinn and Einar's and Arnheide's slave experience. It's acknowledged that they got it relatively easy. And I feel like that's important to enforce in an arc that actually has positive effects on Thorfinn while he's a slave. No, slavery isn't just rehabilitation in a farm for most. But actually there is a similarity between theirs and Arnheid's situation. While Kettle himself isn't being mean to them and even favors them to some extent, that earns them hostility from other people in the farm who feel like their status is threatened or undermined as a result. The farmhands and Kettle's wife respectively. These couple chapters do that cool thing where we see events and characterization before we see their roots, why they are like that. The Iron Fist legend and the way Kettle acts in contrast to it, Arnheide's treatment and the questioning about her situation. The manga especially has some really cool framings of Arnheide and Kettle during the trial that have a lot of subtext. The context arrives at the end of the episode. Kettle was never a warrior and Arnheide is Kettle's slave concubine. Excellent storytelling. It's amazing just how much characterization passively happens in the trial section. Thorgil is pretty self-explanatory, but his influence on the other characters is the most interesting part. Snake is insistent that his job is done and correctly, no matter what punishment, consequences are necessary for him. He's not heartless, but he is firm. All this time I've been calling him Pater, that's just how I read it, but apparently it's Pater, after finally googling it. But he's a chad, he's not going to let those kids get maimed. He's smart and gives practical solutions both Snake, Kettle and Thorgil will accept. As much of an asshole Thorgil is, he's not some maniac, uh, mostly. And maybe you'll disagree after what happens next, but I actually do believe he admired Stur's bravery and wanted to be a part of this. 
Obviously what he's doing is awful, but it comes from a certain Viking warrior perspective, that hardship creates great men, like he said about Canute, or wants for his brother. Moving on to Ketil, weak-willed, insecure, like Olmar, which makes sense after what we learned last episode. Hoards wealth, gets paranoid, spends it on security. His lie about Iron Fist is the same, a form of protection, and gives him some authority, some standing. He is too small a man for everything he represents and is responsible for. He has overextended. He feels lost during the entire second half. And for once the subs did not fail me. They got the detail where he is about to say 5 and changes it to 10, cause that's an amazing piece of characterization. 5 would not make him look firm enough. I wish they included that page where he stares at Peter for help. Damn it, why exclude that? So that is the cliff notes on this episode. Wait for the season to be over and then watch my video. Or better yet, read the manga. From the beginning. Okay, episode 8 I have significantly less to say, cause it's more direct. Thorfinn and Dinar talk about Thorfinn's character, it explains itself. There were no anime additions I disliked here. I was a bit worried about what they could have added here, <laughs> I wanna hear no sentimentalities about Askelad. Leave his and Thorfinn's relationship as it was in the manga. I am not into the whole thorfinn Askelad complex relationship with a lot of baggage hype train. I swear, it, it distracts Vinland fans so damn hard. And I really appreciate how this scene is written. Thorfinn hated Askeladd enough to kill him. And then someone else killed him. The sincerity that came out of his final moments, those are the words that allowed Thorfinn's anger to subside eventually. That probably would have happened anyway, but it does add another layer to it. That's it. And Askeladd is hand-waved a bit here, cause it's not about him really. Thorfinn is not grieving for him. It's about Thorfinn being a man without substance. And of course, it's not only that, there's more he's forgetting related to his dreams. The beginning starts with the ending of episode 6.5, what? This is new stuff. And this was Einar's family in Thorfinn's dream. They set this up in episode 6, when Einar specifically tells Thorfinn about them, and something is obviously being signaled. This is of course a dream, this didn't happen for real. We know, timeline doesn't match up anyway. And that leads to Thorfinn climbing out of the cliff, which is in the manga. I like Zverkel's involvement here and how he constantly tells them to work instead of pondering about change, cause you know, talking about it forever won't do anything, you have to keep moving. About the production here, this was the opposite of the previous episode. A lot of the art was wonky, more than most other episodes, but direction I quite liked. Music was on point, atmosphere was on point, but kinda worried about how future episodes will look. I'm feeling a season 1 middle of the season theme with decreased quality around episode 14. Feels like it could happen around episode 9 which will look incredible, I'm sure. Just have some sweat on my forehead for episodes 15 onward, you know? Cause I need them to look good. But here it's a couple of stuff that I miss from the manga. I wanted to see if they'll do them the same, but they didn't. First is this frame, which even suspiciously moves exactly how it needs to to have a young Thorfinn in the empty space like in the manga. What is this, gonna be a Blu-ray exclusive? More understandable, but also hurting my heart more, is the Thorfinn beatdown. Not the punch, that was fantastic. But when he gets hit, I just love how it's done in the manga. I kind of wanted or expected them to cut the sound when he gets hit in the head and have it far away and reverberating, you know what I mean. That's also exactly what the manga implies, and that dizziness effect in the manga with the overlaid art, awesome effect. And every shot from Thorfinn's perspective is slanted on top of it, for the whole thing to feel unbalanced. The old lady is standing there with the characters, Thorfinn sees her behind them, but also a bit translucent and doesn't shake like the other characters, cause she's not a result of his actual vision. I understand that it would be difficult for the anime to do that though. The general feel of the scene still acceptable and I really liked the falling segment. The old lady's inclusion in episode 4 I questioned a bit cause she first appears here in the manga and I like when something cool isn't repeated too much and is left to be unique. Cause it's a really cool callback that has meaning and comes out of nowhere. But they didn't spam her and add her anywhere else and her appearance in episode 4 was really brief so I have no problem with it. <sighs> this is a thing with me, I'll explain it now. I want a story to be dense and have details and the small stuff that are meaningful, so everything has more to find out if you pay attention. 
I don't want you to make a big deal out of everything. I don't like sew-offs. I don't want you to start sewing me every little thing and present it like it's the most amazing thing ever. Yes, please, undersell it to me. I like the approach of, here's the main thing, what you need to get, but with that, there's all this cool stuff I wasn't told I'm getting. Have you ever ordered and the delivery comes with like an extra croissant? That to me shows real confidence. You know what everything you're offering is worth. You don't dilute the entire experience. The synergy will be ruined. I don't want the pita bread and the tzatziki sauce and the meat as separate meals dedicated to themselves. I want it all modestly working together. I'm still baffled that people think they'll get others into the city they like by screaming set seats praises to the heavens. That's not how it works and you look like an idiot. Anyway, rant over. We'll come back to the Pitogiro when the time comes. Don't worry, it's not about something I expect them to screw up. They've already screwed it up in season 1. Actually, this episode did remove a pretty major moment. Has big panel and all. And I think it's better off for it. Cause knowing certain scenes in the future, it's a redundant moment that doesn't need to be repeated so much. Leave it for later. There was a lot of CGI usage, but in a good way. That's where CGI should be used. 3D environments benefit so much from it. You can do complex camera movements that would be otherwise impossible. The branches here look so much better cause it's not just a PNG moving across the screen. And it also doesn't have the usual problems associated with CGI. It's not animated. I think anything else I'll reserve for the next episode. There's a bit to talk about Thorfinn's outburst in the end. Okay, see you next time.